This is Mark Mullinax, and welcome back to Power for the Peaceful, a podcast and class on Taoism. Episode 10, Early Retirement. When you listen to the ground and you put your roots down, you can hear what she says if you're listening. When you listen to the ground and you put your roots down, you can hear what she says if you're listening. The sweet sound of the river as she moves over the stones. The same song that the blood in your body sings as it weaves around your bones. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? Ours is a culture based on excess, on overproduction. The result is a steady loss of sharpness in our sensory experience. All the conditions of modern life, its material plenitude, its sheer crowdedness, enjoin to dull our sensory faculties. What is more important now is to recover our senses. We must learn to see more, to hear more to feel more. Susan Sontag, Against Interpretation, 1964. Hello, and I hope your recent days have been peaceful. You just heard our quote weaver and question raiser, Wendy Dover, a librarian in Western North Carolina. I think you'll like her great question in a few moments. Today, verse nine of Tao Te Ching. At its core, this verse portrays Taoism's vision of teaching an individual, a community, or even a civilization to let go. Be careful, this verse advises, in how far one goes, or how widely we extend ourselves, or how deeply we may want to insinuate ego into our lives and projects. By letting go, by retiring early in one's schemes, one returns to one's natural, spontaneous, originally peaceful state. Holding on to unnatural desires leads only to hopeless gain and competes with one's original state of harmony. When I practice the unnatural, I not only tip, but also tilt the harmonic balance that is my natural birthright and gift. This verse asks us why we do more than we need to do. What would happen if we did only the truly necessary and no more? Nearly every faith and philosophy teaches this idea of reining in one's ego so as not to lose oneself by getting overextended. So this concept is hardly unique with Taoism. However, Taoism's approach gives us a clue, a sense, how emptiness is our natural state. And to fill up on anything alien or unnatural makes us aliens to ourselves and unnaturally anxious. So let's hear verse 9. Early retirement. A cup filled past the brim is waste, and a knife over sharpened loses its edge. Fill a space with too much gold or jade, and who can guard it? Overwork yourself with honor, status, or pride, and how do you avoid ruin? Too much of anything leads straight to meddling chaos. Early retirement is heaven's nature. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? Part one, retire the ego. I offered earlier that many faiths and spiritualities teach something like this verse. Taoism's unique approach to ego management, however, is to show what happens when we take things too far. Nothing good happens when we overfill a cup with liquid or over sharpen a knife so it has no substance left to maintain a sharp edge. Nothing good happens with too much food, drink, consumption nothing. And these are not just not good. Because they are not of Tao, they are extremely temporary and will return like a hungry ghost, and they render us useless to ourselves and to others. 
The key is to know how much is enough and when does enough happen. Can we know or even recognize what enough looks or feels like? I think so, but it's a counter-cultural experience if we do. Anybody ready for that? Here's a lesson on knowing when to retire or surrender the ego. This retirement is a gift to oneself, but such surrender hangs on our paying attention. For we have to learn to recognize in the very moment, in real time, when enough is enough for you. When too much of a good thing has just turned the corner and gone off into the artificial and unnatural. Because you know how it is when we are surrounded by abundance or privileged, how difficult it is to find our self-awareness and attention and to know when to loosen our grasp and surrender abundance. Because more, more, ever more is the siren song of our economic systems. You will be incomplete as long as you do not buy this, acquire that, own one of these new gizmos, and surround yourself with abundant opulence. So don't delay. Our culture's advertising and economic systems cater to the ego. So who in their right mind would ever want to be countercultural and just say, no thanks, I'm enough already. How does that happen anyway? For is it not a struggle to recognize when to reply with a strong no, enough to culture's sirens? Enough possessions, enough television, enough of hatred, enough of a super busy schedule. Is there any way to retire early from these? Because once these things begin, it's hard to retire from them. I watch and I wonder and I think. I think of the old slavery and of the way the economy has now improved upon it. The new slavery has improved upon the old by giving the new slaves the illusion that they are free. The economy does not take people's freedom by force, which would be against its principles, for it is very humane. It buys their freedom, pays for it, and then persuades its money back again with shoddy goods and the promise of freedom. Buy a car, it says, and be free. Buy a boat and be free. Buy a beer and be free. Is this not the raw material of bad dreams? Or maybe it is the very nightmare itself. Wendell Berry. Part two, the problem of self-awareness. How can we grow self-awareness if we are ever in the shadow of culture's influences? We can become so satisfied and yet so ignorant at the same time. How would we ever know when to stop to retire early? Let's answer this question with another question, a most revolutionary and yet instructive question. What if we are already enough? What if there is, despite all the voices around me shouting otherwise, abundance already within? And that, naturally. Can we learn to trust oneself and not a culture that hardly knows you, so we'll know how to live? Only when you do not know yourself, the opinion of other people becomes important. Sadhguru. But even trust is a muscle that needs practice. We know in relationships how difficult it is to trust again that partner who has cheated or betrayed us, right? No one would blame you if you cut your losses and put that relationship in the rear view mirror. But true trust requires a rephrasing of this question. What if we let ourselves down and do things or tell stories to ourselves, lies actually, that make us untrustworthy? even to ourself. Like that promise you made to yourself never ever to do something again and there you are, less than a week later, breaking that promise to yourself. What damage does that do to our sense of self? The truth will set you free, said David Foster Wallace, but not until it's finished with you. To practice this verse 9, we need to be able to have a personal practice of never lying to or breaking trust with ourself. Or we end up living a most strange life, one in which we regard and treat ourselves unworthy of self-trust. Ever been there? I've done this. It's hell. The homework here is hard. We tell ourselves the truth, all the truth, all the time. 
For when one builds a practice of radical truth-telling to oneself, then one knows when to retire early from any habit, the profits of which are strangely thin to non-existent. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening? Part three, the problem with too much. Can you name a time when habits of overworking, overthinking, overproducing, overexercising, and overworrying ever accomplished a positive thing? And yet, we still do it all the time. It's as if we are addicted to their chaotic anxieties. Not able to know when to retire the ego, maybe we make a devil's bargain with greed. Society always creates and promises a fake sense of happiness that happens when we drown ourselves in the overproduction of things, media, food, possessions. Look around. Do we see other animals drowning in the swamps of excess like us humans? The concept of too much always has at its root, somewhere, the baseless fear of inadequacy. Not good enough is a reactive feeling and it seems like a good plan to go the opposite way. I'm speaking about self-medicating our sense of inadequacies with too much of the wrong things, wrong foods, wrong drugs, and wrong relationships. When these become habits, I mean addictions, we lose our freedom through unnatural attachments stimulated by our senses of not being good enough. Anything I've ever tried to keep by force, I've lost. Marie Howe. One often overlooked place where we get seduced by too much is the sense of feeling that somehow we should be perfect. Oh, how society can get its hooks in us in its constant messages that we should be perfect. And right now we're not perfect. So we are to be perfect little children, perfect students with perfect attitudes, perfect workers with perfect bodies, perfect athletes, perfect beauty. Of course, standards of perfection change all the time. And all this endorsed and watched over by a perfect God, male, of course, and that God's priests charged with sniffing out imperfection. We inherited this absurd notion of perfection from Plato, who, after 2,500 years, still infects us with the nagging hangnail of a thought that we are just not good enough as we are. Perfection exists, he said, but not in our material body. Instead, we are always several degrees or steps away from perfection because we have these slowly disintegrating flesh bodies that don't last forever. So we are to look to our souls to be perfect in some afterlife. Meanwhile, here in this life, our flesh needs to be tortured, medicated, and transcended so we can more nearly approach perfection. What a nightmare. This urge to be perfect has driven many of us to be workaholics, anxious, to carry around a never-ending sense of inadequacy, and never trusting themselves. Do we want to live this life always chasing some unattainable ideal? Is that a good life? When we try to live up to the impossible image of a spirituality enlightened, knowledgeable, selfless, patient, forgiving, easygoing, supportive, generous, superhuman, the dark side of our nature must gain in power. Tokopa Turner. Part four, the struggle to be an honest being. What does it mean to be human? How do our communities shape our conceptions of who we are? These are lifelong wrestlings. Many are the voices, especially some alleged spiritual voices that say, we're not good enough. We don't deserve the love, the compassion, the care that they say are in short supply. And they meter this abundance out to folks as if our worth were in question. What if we are already whole, already healthy, already perfected and already completed? What if we need spend no time or treasure to close the artificial gap between us and some societal nightmare of perfection? 
instead of perfect, what if we start telling the truth about ourselves? That we are already complete, good enough, adequate. Yeah, we all fail, but are our failings due to fatal inborn flaws? If there's a God, does God make us incomplete and then blame us for not being perfect? Does God create us with a limp and then blame us for using crutches? I'll conclude with a true story. It's a Buddhist story about a golden Buddha. Monks in Thailand created in either the 13th or 14th century a statue of a gold Buddha, nearly 10 feet tall, 5.5 tons of gold. At some point, a couple of centuries later, in a chaotic time in Thailand, the statue was completely plastered over to prevent it from being stolen. The statue was covered with a thick layer of stucco, which was painted and then inlaid with bits of colored glass. I mean, what do you do with a 5.5 ton golden statue when the invaders are on the way? Can you say, hide it in plain sight? Well, the plan worked too well. The statue lay forgotten among the ruins without attracting much attention. Many of the monks that painted the statue died off. But in 1955, the statue was moved to a new building. During the moving process, a piece of plaster fell off and the true realization of what a treasure it was became known. Its true identity had been lost for nearly 200 years. The monks had had this golden treasure in their very midst for centuries, but had not realized it. This story always cheers my open and Christian students. And I tell it now as it bears on our verse nine. For we who live in culture do struggle with our nature. Do we believe the chatter that we are inadequate, imperfect and sinful? Or do we trust that we are already golden, already good enough? What if we are originally gold and we know it only after we give early retirement to the stucco and plaster with which our cultures would have us appear in? To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Ralph Waldo Emerson What if we instead of spending vast amounts of energy and ego assisted struggles to get or become more. We just rest in our enoughness. What if our original nature is not sin or deficiency or with inborn appetites towards evil, but good, goodness, golden, greatness, even glory. If we are already golden, adequate, completed, then why the rush to get too much and to overextend? What keeps us from retiring our hesitancy to live as the peaceful people that we are. The creative force of Tao is beautifully portrayed in this verse. Just do the necessary and no more. Know when to stop sharpening your ego. The lesson is simple, but difficult to practice. Go only so far like water poured into a cup and then stop at the right time. The lesson of verse nine is to gain fulfillment by emptying, letting go of the crap that will always cry for your attention you're guarding, you're insuring, and you're worrying about. This is good news. We can establish the right time to retire ideas and things that have pretty much mucked up our world. We can also practice such retirement. We can retire the too muchness of negative voices, racism, war. We can retire the ego for it will never ever retire on its own. You're already good enough originally perfected, originally gold. Oh, how I laugh when I think of my vague, indefinite riches. No run on my bank can drain it, for my wealth is not possession, but enjoyment. Henry David Thoreau. So what's our homework, my friends? Just interview a retired person and ask them what they have gained and lost upon their retirement. Are they happier before retirement? or after. And now Wendy's question for us. With this in mind, how does one differentiate between the symbols of external material wealth, that is the accumulation of things and the commodification of self, 
and the internal spiritual, emotional, and psychological well, and in so doing, find their optimal balance and diminish the alienation one experiences as an aspect of modern life. Wendy, marvelous question, one we've touched on a bit already. You ask how we may discern and trust the truth of our internal, already resident Tao processes and learn to distrust more the shiny temptations of status symbols and status seeking. Well, which is more permanent? Which has a future? In my experience, as soon as I collect yet one more symbol or trifle, I don't feel gratitude, peace, or calm. Oh no, I begin the search for the next status symbol or commodity. There's no end to my status seeking, no end to making myself look better, seem better. How many thousands of dollars have I spent in assuring myself that this purchase or that travel destination will finally solidify my status? I will finally attain perfection. Huh, it never does. Within a few minutes or days, I am off again on some other relentless, anxious, and self-forgetting venture to fill my hungry ghosts with artificial junk. You ask how you can differentiate between this junk and the more lasting, even eternal, internal values that are ours already. I mentioned in this episode the value of learning how to discern truth from falsity, so I won't expand on that anymore. Instead, let me focus just on gratitude, just being thankful for what is, what one has, your interwebbed connections with already wonderful people, our networks with nature, those quiet moments of sharing with a relative, or just being in the presence of a child. These are priceless. Anything that comes with a price is suspect. What I mean is beautifully expressed in Irving Berlin's song, I Got Sun in the Morning. Here it goes, and I'll conclude with this. Taking stock of what I have and what I haven't, what do I find? The things I got will keep me satisfied. Checking up on what I have and what I haven't, what do I find? A healthy balance on the credit side. Got no diamond, got no pearl. Still, I think I'm a lucky girl. I got sun in the morning and the moon at night. I got sun in the morning and the moon at night. And with the sun in the morning and the moon in the evening, I'm all right. Got no mansion, got no yacht. Still, I'm happy with what I got. Sunshine gives me a lovely day. Moonlight gives me the Milky Way. Got no checkbooks, got no banks. What I got can't be bought or sold. Still, I'd like to express my thanks. I got sun in the morning and the moon at night. I got sun in the morning and the moon at night. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an original labor of love designed, written, and co-produced by many whose central idea is that Tao Te Ching remains good news for today. Tao still speaks. Thanks so much to Wendy Dover for her readings and question. Audrey Davis is our artist. Molly Hartwell sings her song, Put Your Roots Down. Fortress Press holds the copyright for quotations from my Tao Te Ching translation. Thanks to you for your attendance in this class on Taoism. May your days begin in peace and become wombs for radical hope. When you're listening, when you're listening, are you listening?